Welcome to the Edge Dwellers Cafe, an interview-based podcast featuring conversations at the convergence of politics, environment and mental health in a world on edge. My name is Ben Habib and I'm an international relations scholar, an environmentalist, permaculture practitioner and neurodivergent coffee drinker. Join me in my quest to explore the edges that define us, divide us, and shape how we interact with each other as we grapple with the extraordinary changes taking place across our world. Order a hot beverage and get comfortable. This is the Edge Dwellers Cafe. Greetings, Edge Dwellers. In this episode, we're returning to the theme of environmentalism and the permaculture movement. Permaculture practice is premised upon three core ethics, earth care, people care, and fair share. But while permaculture's complex systems approach to earth care is quite highly developed, there's still much work to be done across the movement in manifesting the people care and fair share ethics to full fruition. Permaculture's understanding of the complexity of social systems is not nearly as advanced as its understanding of ecosystems. Fortunately, though, there's a growing number of practitioners around the world who are dedicated to rectifying this weak spot in the permaculture design system. In this episode, I'm joined by Toad Dell and Guy Ritani from Permaqueer. Permaqueer is a collaborative effort to share ecological sustainability methods through the lens of permaculture focusing on accessibility to and building resilience for traditionally marginalised communities. I first came across Permaqueer through their amazing Instagram page, which has an amazing aesthetic and a sophistication of content that really stood out. But more importantly, the work that Guy and Toad are doing with Permaqueer is addressing this glaring gap in permaculture practice and community building. They bring a queering and decolonizing approach to permaculture that's rigorous, it's innovative, and it's sorely needed within the broader permaculture movement. In much-deserved international recognition for this work, Permaqueer received the 2021 Lush Spring Prize for Social and Environmental Regeneration. And once you've had a listen to this conversation, you'll see exactly why. A quick plug before we dive into the main conversation. You can support this podcast by clicking on the like or subscribe buttons and or leave a review on whatever platform you're listening on. You can also help support the production of the podcast by making a one-off or an ongoing monetary contribution of any amount via the Ko-Fi link. All contributions go towards offsetting the initial goal of covering the cost of researching, hosting, editing and equipment for the podcast. But from there, my next goal is to make enough of a surplus to be able to employ a sound editor to take over the editing duties on the podcast, and preferably to be able to give that opportunity to an emerging talent. But now, without any further delay, it's time for my conversation with Toad Dell and Guy Ritani. The Edge Dwellers Cafe. Okay, the permaculture movement has a new bright shining star at the moment, and that is the new or newish organization called Permaqueer. And today on Edge Dwellers Cafe, I'm joined by Guy Ritani and and Toad Dell from Permaqueer, the great minds behind Permaqueer. Thank you so much for joining us. Thank you for having us, Ben. (laughs) Thank you. It's it's very wonderful to be here. My name is, as, as you said, is Toad. Uh, the pronouns I use are they, them, and it, and I'm actually calling to you here from one Juraburus country of the Yukime language group. And Guy, where are you joining us from? Um, I'm also on uh, one Juraburus country in the Yukime group, and I'm currently looking out of a beautiful old grain forest out the front of our, where we're currently settled, and it's such a privilege to be here around an intact ecosystem that was maintained and uplifted for time immemorial by the First Nations people um, here. And it's actually such a shame that the community efforts of restoring and preserving that have not um, been adequate. And I think it's really important, even though this is a podcast to acknowledge that wherever we are, um, it's important that that history and that Indigenous sovereignty is uplifted and acknowledged and um, 
for Toad and I, I suppose I'll, I'll, I'll acknowledge that sovereignty was never ceded here um, and we always need to acknowledge the elders past, present and the emerging leaders um, that support us. So, yeah, and I extend that to wherever you're calling in from as well, Ben, so thank you. Yeah, so I'm joining us from uh, Wurundjeri country in Nam, as always. So I do acknowledge that on the website, but you're right, it is important to say it. Permaculture, what was its initial appeal to you and, and how did you find this movement? I, I love that as a, as a question. Um, I actually came to permaculture through an ex-partner of mine who I'm very good friends with, thankfully. And I think I saw it as something being done, but I didn't really understood, like understand how it applied to me till I moved into a permaculture share house in, um, in Melbourne, uh, in Blackburn, uh, with Deldent Fleming, who's a permaculture teacher. Um, I understood it to be this kind of thing that like wealthy, like white landowners did on their lifestyle block. I didn't really understood how it could apply to me in an urban setting, uh, especially to my communities. But um, I was living there and like the, the social permaculture that happened, like the dumpster diving food networks, the food is free, the, the kind of um, sharing between like food growers and things like that. Like when I moved in, I was able to access a like, not a free, like paid it for in different, in different kinds of labor, like a permaculture design course. I got to have food security as part of my rent. And I got to see that like permaculture is a design methodology that could be applied to my communities and like really managed to provide me with security as like a student. And I, 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 in that moment, I was like, oh, this isn't something that just is done in the country. Like this is something that can be really, really useful uh, for myself and my communities. And like, yeah, and I'll hand it over to you, Guy. Yeah, I think... For me, when I, I mean, it was at the same time, I, I think Toad knew, had more of a background understanding of what permaculture was. But I'm really grateful that I entered permaculture from a, a grassroots perspective. So like via the community, via seeing what was actually happening and having direct impacts from these systems, as opposed to what's what I'm seeing quite a lot now is people are learning the politics of it first. They're mm. learning the ideas and the stigmas of it. And I think had I learned through that way, I wouldn't have gotten as involved because there are a lot of um, interesting, you know, characters and interesting um, histories behind uh, what is essentially a, a tool that we can use um, to help us live in harmony with the environment. But for me, it came across by directly meeting some of the needs that I had. So, you know, I was in that same trans transition home with Toad. COVID hit, you know, I lost my job. I lost all my income. I was working as a body worker at the time um, in a massage place and that wasn't going to happen with COVID um, and you know being a New Zealand citizen I did, didn't have any government support so I had literally nothing um, but I had good systems design and I didn't realize how valuable that was until I compared it to a lot of people in my community that didn't have that and it was stark it was incredibly stark and I realized how well these systems were designed when these aspects were considered. But I don't think if I had come to it through learning the histories and the politics and all the polarizing things, I think I would have been very deterred. But because these systems tangibly changed my life, um, that really set me off to understand what permaculture can do when it's utilized appropriately. It's a really interesting point about the difference between the actual design system and the design thinking and systems thinking of permaculture and the contours of the movement itself and the, and the different kinds of people and different communities that fall under the collective umbrella of permaculture. Mm, absolutely. Yeah, I, uh, I was yeah. just going to say, I was just going to say, there's a compl I would say there's almost a 180 sometimes between permaculture as a design methodology and permaculture and practice and the, the communities that pick it up and who it's available to even. I would say I really love the design methodology and I really don't love the movement. The movement is um, predominantly, uh, I don't know, there, there's a lot of problematic things happening. And, you know, more recently with um, COVID and all of the responses and how leaders have 
lead um, ha- has caused a lot of uh, strife, especially when it comes to social equity. So, yeah, I suppose it's all I'll say on that one. <laughs> yeah. I, I'm very hard on it now, I think, because that's that's fresh in our mind. But there, when I do speak about, I don't want to speak of the permaculture movement or the permaculture community as a monolith either. Uh, it, it's like, if it weren't for the women in permaculture who really set, um, like, the the culture in which we exist within, we wouldn't actually, like, we've been so supported by by women in permaculture, whether it's financially, whether it's housing, where, whether it's access to education as well. Like, I see that there's many, di- like, there's this very kind of publicized face of permaculture. And then I see so much work actual in the community organizing and the actual logistics of making things happen uh, being done. Uh, and I'll say predominantly by women in those spaces as well. Um, so it, it's just an interesting beast because there's this very visible face and this very like unrecognized face as well. Yeah, permaculture, it, it, the movement is definitely not a monolith. Mm, absolutely. And women in the movement have really been the leading edge of social permaculture, haven't they? And absolutely. Yeah. yeah, taking permaculture mm. design thinking away from something that's more of a technical methodology into something that actually fulfills its promise as a, as a socioeconomic uh, system of living. Absolutely. And there's some real complexities there in that when it's an academic thing, it's very prized and sought after and then everyone's patting everyone on the back saying, oh, isn't this clever? Uh, but when it actually comes to the, the making it work and the, the soft skills and the, I would say even academic, but the um, more community side of it, of, of making it a real thing, uh, there isn't as much congratulations sometimes. And I think, you know, even in the energy of it, like historically permaculture has been a very, you know, sage on a stage, I bestow this information from my land to you. And, and it's very much the woman in permaculture, at least in my experience, that have held that feminine space, that regenerative uh, community resonance, that that's an energy that frankly the entire world needs in in spades at the moment we're really struggling with these stressed out systems that are based on this very hyper masculine patriarchal power over and all of a sudden we're seeing these mutual aid you know loving caring horizontal ethics leading the intentions of how these sort of projects work and and they're actually benefiting community so much more so you know i think it was really really critical to have that shift and leadership from women in permaculture and I think we should still ha- have have much stronger um, leadership throughout permaculture and yeah I think that's quite important to us here at Permaqueer as well. Using the language of power over and power with sounds very influenced by Starhawk mm. you know one of the great mm. permaculture elders and and one of the great activists as well. She's very cool I'm, I'm a little bit of a bit of, bit of a fan <laughs> of her work yeah we've been really lucky uh, in like Victoria and in Southeast Queensland to be supported by some really, really cool activist community organizing permaculture folk. Yeah, well, let's hand out some flowers here. Who are the who are the people doing this great work in your orbit? That's a really, thank you, actually. Uh, specifically, I've had a lot of support by Robin Clayfield. She's been incredible. Maura Gamble is another incredible woman who's been very, like, um, supportive, uh, like, logistically. We had Delden Fleming, like, who pragmatically made uh, it affordable for me to do a permaculture design course. I, I learned from her. Um, those are like three of them also like who's been incredible support to us in kind of helping hone our understanding of permaculture and permaqueer has been Meg McGowan from Permacoach. Like that woman is phenomenal and a, and a force of nature. And then, you know, tangibly, you know, we wouldn't be in a, in a lot of the positions we were without Rosemary Morrow, who has yeah. been such a, a, an anchor of support for us and has, you know, given us nothing but but support, care, and, um, and, and actually was the reason we got a lot of funding, to be completely honest. Mm-hmm. Um, and, and then beyond that, you know, Brenna Quinlan has been a huge support to us and is doing incredibly momentous work through the, the art form that she carries and then beyond that, we have some amazing uh, permaculture di- design women of colour, like Elizabeth Coos, who is based out of Costa Rica, who pioneered liberation permaculture and has done a huge amount of work in um, intersectional 
you know, social justice within the environmentalism movement. Um, and it'd be a mess without mentioning our um, permaculture grandmother, Tamara Griffiths, who operates out of Belgrave down, down in Nam. So, you know, there's an endless list of, and we've definitely missed out some of them, but um, many, many flowers from our beautiful garden that were all sown by these incredible women. Yeah, I'm familiar with the work of all of those people and they're all doing amazing things. So here, here, seconded on my behalf as well. So to come back to the, the, the chronology, you discover permaculture. What was the path from there to launching Permaqueer and where Permaqueer is at now? Oh, I like that one. Um, so I think, you know, very much that witnessing how well good design had on our lives when, when our systems were tested, when, when COVID isolation first came in to, to Nam or Melbourne, the most locked down city in the world. And we really experienced firsthand how um, propping up systems of, you know, bartering economy for, uh, for, for rental and accommodation, having community food systems and having a, a community economy helps support you when larger systems that we rely on actually cannot do that anymore. And so Toad and I were like, oh, you know, th there's, there's something here. Like we need to, we need to start teaching. And initially it was because there were just some language and culture barriers for permaculture to actually be taught to queer people. The, there was a lack of respect of pronouns. There were all of these binary assumptions that frankly just made queer and gender diverse people feel uncomfortable in this space. And so we started by just trying to make it a welcome space and a safe space. Oh, you've buffered out for a minute. Oh, yeah, guys disappeared. <laughs> um, they'll be back in a minute. I, I might hop in and then hand it over to them then. It really did happen, uh, you know, when lockdown had hit us and Guy, who's a New Zealand citizen, uh, wasn't able to secure an income anymore. Uh, but we'd built up food systems and community economies and things like that. So we were functionally able to actually be in a state of abundance, despite everything else kind of falling apart. Uh, we had so much community support and so much kind of uh, structural support within our little community. Um, the perma, like the language that I use for permaqueer uh, came from my actual, my final PDC, like final design was actually like trying to take, uh, you know, do my design on like, how can I make permaculture work for myself and my communities? And I, we just started up as a little Instagram page. Uh, and it wasn't anything fancy, actually. It was just the the title, if anything. And it was um, Guy and I who came together and were like, oh, like during a lockdown, like this has done us really good. What if we decided to teach permaculture online to some um, um, to some of our other communities? Like it's, it's helped us. Maybe we can make it accessible to other people in our community who are finding permaculture a little bit inaccessible because of the language, the assumption you had to be living on these giant blocks of land, uh, just things that we couldn't see ourselves in, in a lot of permaculture. Uh, and we're like, hey, actually you can be in permaculture. Permaculture can work for you. Uh, so we started teaching online to our, our communities um, and we blew up pretty quickly, actually. I think there was one class like a, like a few weeks into when we started teaching where we had a class where we had people from Iceland, North America, South America, um, England and Australia. And we're, so we're like, oh, oh, this is really exciting. Like people are really kind of enjoying this work and, and curious about what we're doing. So that's actually where we started. We just started off there. And it's kind of just continually snowballed. Um, Guy, who's an absolute bureaucratic wizard and entrepreneur extraordinaire, uh, managed to secure us a TEDx license as well. So I think that's what propelled Permaqueer from like this kind of like dinky little little, you know, two people teaching online introductory, uh, introductory courses on Zoom to something a little bit more established. And we had a whole team of people like uh, our housemate Cicely and our um, housemate Dell who helped us organize um, the first TEDx. And um, we were really grateful because it was during the first, it was, we jokingly call it the fun lockdown when it was still very novel and people were just getting into Zoom and it was kind of fun. And we're like, well, hey, look, we're all on screens talking to each other. Um, back when it was then, before it got depressing. Um, <laughs> and we managed to host this TEDx series, and it was um, TEDx Permaqueer, uh, Community Solutions to Climate Change. 
And we were very lucky because we had a lot of really fantastic people in permaculture excited by this. Um, so we had people like Rosemary Morrow, Maura Gamble, David Holmgren, Brenna and Charlie, uh, Brenna Quinlan and Charlie McGee um, donate their times as well as all and, and Tyson Younger Porter, like these really fantastic people who kind of donated their times to help us with, with this event. And I also want to give some, some real uh, recognition to Tyson who actually helped shape permaqueer a little bit. We managed to get him on a Zoom and one of the first things he said was like, are you queers doing permaculture or are you queering permaculture? Because I don't really have interest in just working with queers doing permaculture. That's not really new or exciting. And I was kind of like, oh, oh shit, um, we're, we're queering permaculture. And then we, then we started to have to really, um, really kind of deep into what does it mean to queer permaculture? We used it to teach our communities uh, to kind of support them what actually could permaculture be benefited by a queer presence and queer theory. And that's where I think, and you know, I, I don't want to say the rest is history because we're still very much in it. Um, and it, there's still a lot of labor of love work in, in permaqueer. Um, but that's very much kind of how the trajectory went. We had a, we had that TEDx, we've, we've since done a permaculture design course, which has done really well. Uh, we both were taught by Meg McGowan, Rosemary Morrow and Mark Wardle. We did our teacher training there. Uh, and then we did, we actually just wrapped up another TEDx Permaqueer series, um, TEDx Permaqueer Cultural Responses to Climate Change, where we uh, all the money raised that we've raised um, is going towards um, an Indigenous land back in initiative, a really cool social enterprise run by Auntie Terry called Sevgen. Um, she's paying off one of the largest bush tucker orchards in Australia to be owned by First Nations people, um, and it was just really fantastic to be able to make these connections. Um, and now, of course, we're still sitting in that work of what does it mean to queer permaculture? And I think that's where we have this inward facing work of working with queer communities and this outward facing work of like, how, do, how can we benefit and queer permaculture and make it more delicious and exciting and allow for other people of diverse backgrounds, and lived experiences to see themselves in it, to see how it can be applied to them and not this kind of like pipe dream of rich, rich people who own heaps and heaps of land. I'm back. Yeah, I was just going to add to to that of where where we're kind of moving towards. We've we've always said from the beginning that permaqueer is a network, and we've always modelled it off mycelium of of how do we transform resources and redistribute them to where they're appropriate. And you know, Toad and I really acknowledge where we sit within the ecosystem of privilege, and that we we are very, very privileged to be in a lot of the spaces that we're in. And we find ourselves more times than not um, the only queer people in there. I normally find myself the only Indigenous person there. And it's because of our privilege that we're, we're in these spaces. And so we recognise that our mycelial role is to take the resources that we have we have access to and then transvest them back into appropriate spaces. So that was sort of always um, held within what was permaqueer as as a network of redistribution and now we're running a bunch of different programs on um, building regenerative capacity and and pushing the limits of ecological design and how do we suspend these new cultures and combine them with our ancestral cultures to to come into the the new tomorrow that is desperately required and I think to 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 where permaqueer is heading we're very much doing a lot of groundwork around how do we create a very, very good system to coordinate resources because, um, you know, our queer community really struggles with that, that, that they rarely ever have resources, mass resources or, or, or life resources to manage and control on their own. Um, and so we're kind of coming from a co-op perspective. How can we have um, resources in commons and, and ensure that our governance of that is appropriate and, and led by ethics and ecology? And, you know, in, in the little experience that we've had, um, in the past so two years of permaqueer, we're seeing how critical it is to ensure that these, to ensure that these systems are supported and built off of ethics and ecological function. And when they when they are built that way, they're so successful. And and it's just kind of hilarious how terribly the rest of the systems that we live on are built when 
it could just be better. And, you know, there's so much tied into why it's not like that, but we're more interested into how do we shift to the other way. And I, I think I want to speak a little bit to that kind of um, ecosystem of privilege as well. Um, we, we do a lot of our kind of social modeling off of ecological systems thinking. And one of the things that we, we talk about is um, kind of, you know, how you have species succession with the weeds and then understories and things building up for that. We think of that a little bit in the way of privilege as well. Uh, you know, permaculture itself uh, never would have kind of been taken up seriously in academic movements had it not been actually delivered by two like middle class, wealthy, like white academic men. Like functionally, if it had been delivered by anyone else, it actually wouldn't have been heard in the in in the era that it was actually delivered. Um, like, and you know, they were a pioneer species. Um, Guy and I are pioneer species. I'm I'm white. I'm AMAB. I, I present male. I'm I, although I am trans non-binary. I'm middle class. Um, I'm a pioneer pioneer species. Uh, it's kind of my what I see my function and my role to be in this ecosystem is to kind of help establish some stuff, but. I accept to exist in spaces like dandelions that are that are inhospitable to other people in my community. Other spaces um, that might be unsafe for other people in my community even, it's uncomfortable for me, but because of my privilege, I'm, I'm safe and I'm able to do that. Um, like weeds, it's my kind of job to kind of break up the soil, but then it's also my uh, kind of duty that when my job there is done to kind of get out of the way for other people. Uh, so Guy and I are always having discussions about like, when is our role as a pioneer species to to kind of be there and when is it actually our role to kind of get the hell out of the way as well oh well so much to unpack in in everything that you've both just said i love what you've said about being the pioneer species and, and so much about permaculture itself is this pioneer species movement if you like of bringing systems thinking into the mainstream thinking of the the first generation of permaculture practitioners as as the pioneer plants uh, you know some of them are really prickly <laughs> and, and at times yes. unpleasant, but at, their charisma was right for the moment. As you said, Toad, uh, those particular people were right for the moment that they arrived and were able to bring it further, and now there's a new generational change and a new set of people coming into this movement to help permaculture thinking evolve and bring it to new places, which exactly. is a fantastic moment to be in. And I think it's a really... It's a, it's a difficult period because it's a transition period. Uh, you know, it's like we have older pioneer species who still should be, uh, you know, respected and, and, and cared for. But then how do we actually engage in social succession as much as we do ecological succession as well? And what does it look like? What does that process actually look like? What are some of the core assumptions of queer theory that inform your work? And what's the lineage coming out of queer activism, which is not necessarily well understood elsewhere in the permaculture movement and more broadly? I suppose for me, I, I definitely didn't come from an academic approach to queer theory. I came from a life experience. Like, you know, as a child, I was so unlike everybody around me. I always thought something was wrong with me. I transitioned and became Sarah at about four years old and lived as Sarah for a little while, transitioned back to Guy. I always wore weird things. I always sang weird songs. And I always, there was always this weird kind of like othering that I experienced. And, and a, a lot of times, you know, that was really harmful to me personally. And so I assimilated for safety. For me, the life experience and, and, and the assumptions that I have come from the joy that I have experienced and the joy that I have been able to offer because I have lived my life in the way that I have, because at, at times I became this jester or I became this, you know, funny creature or, or whatever, but actually from that place, I could slip in suggestions. I could slip in it, and actually they made carry on effects to these people's lives or to these designs or systems that, otherwise would never have happened. And so, you know, I suppose permaqueer, the main assumption for me is that there is a queer option. There's an option we haven't thought of. There's a horizontal diagonal slide through from far off that actually solves this in a way that's beautiful and pleasurable that we haven't come up with. And I suppose I can't really cite or reference queer theory itself because that's not what it was born of. 
Now, perhaps queer theory made it sound more intellectual than it needed to be, but also <laughs> the, queer, the idea of queering. Yeah, I'd love I'd love mm. to hop in here as well and and say that um, like uh, my favorite definition of queering comes from Hannah Breckbill. I said before, but it's um, interrogating social norms and redesigning uh, to better meet your needs. Um, I actually, when we were coming into here, I had this interesting discussion with an academic queer theorist. And it was very much framing queering as this like interrogation of, of binaries and cis heteronormativity. Uh, and he was, he was framing it and he's a, he's a white cisgendered gay man uh, who's middle upper class. Uh, and he was talking about how it's kind of this, almost this death cult of like, you know, like historically the AIDS epidemic and sodomy and we're not a fertile people and blah, blah, blah. And the more that really struck with me and it kind of was very contrary to my queer experience and my understanding of, of, of queerness, I'll say, uh, because particularly a lot of the trans folk, a lot of the gender diverse folk, a lot of the women who I know who are queer, a lot of the people of color who I know are queer, their lives are very fertile. And so they, have, they have queer families, they have children, they have these very generative expressions of life. And I would say that a lot of that kind of academia, which is very purported by um, cis white gay men, it's centering their own experiences. Uh, it's, it's centering the experiences of, of living and embodying white supremacy while happening to be gay. I think there's some real complexity about queer theory, which is was born um, under the boot of empire, then being used and examined within those institutions and trying to be rationalized and justified. And like, I, I was really upset when people always compare it to a force of death almost, because like for me, it's, it's queer people to live authentically and be queer is to be a survivor. It's to be thriving and embodying something authentically, despite the constant threat of death and violence. You know, it wasn't that long ago we were castrating people chemically or physically. It wasn't that very long ago that we were lynching queer people. And it still happens to get today in some parts. I know a lot of, and you know, it, you know, is in the Reagan um, administration where he turned his back during the AIDS epidemic, and he genuinely believed that AIDS was a was a gift from God to wipe out our populations, the sinful lot. We are deeply affected by trauma, but we're also emerging into this new weird space to be queer a lot of the time. Like I wasn't born from a from a queer trans person. Um, I was born to cisgendered heterosexual people. I had to find my community. I had to build my community. And so there's this really weird experience that's hard to speak to. But for me, it's, it's all about that aggressive pursuit of life authentically and redesigning life and your systems and your communities in a way that can actually allow freedom. And if I apply it academically, like, you know, people say it's the, the critique of binaries. And binaries are a violent thing. Like, you know, gender is out, exists within and outside of binary. I don't want to say that that in itself is violent, although maybe I could. But um, I would say the choice of, you know, if I don't want you to do something, I'll say, you know, it's either this or that. You know, you can either choose the less horrible option or the really terrible option. Like, we use it often as a means of, like, siloing people into competition against each other, into this team or that. When actually there's a lot more of a clever design. There's something there that like exists between in the middle or outside of those kind of dichotomies and binaries. And that's usually a regenerative response. You know what I mean? It's not like, oh, they're um, surrendered to the climate crisis and just live as a, as a filthy, rich, money-making person or like live in a, live in a tent and, and, you know, try to burn down government buildings. Like you can live a, a beautiful life that actually challenges uh, systems of violence while also living in abundance. I think there's so much there that, especially in academia, we try to simplify it down. Whereas for me, queerness, it's the emergence of diversity and diversity as a form of resilience and survival against that which would try to extinguish a lot of people. You know, like queer theory, it's also not just for queer people as well. You know, like feminism came out of women's studies, but feminism really applies to me as someone who is AMAB and you know, embodies toxic masculinity two times, but also me as someone who is femme presenting and experiences a lot of femphobia and misogyny from gay men. Like there's so many complexities there and, and queer theory can be this beautiful generative thing, I want to call it. <laughs> this, this wonderful kind of methodology that can really enrich movements. Would you go so far as to say that 
queering could be a pattern language for interpreting the the really broad and rich complexity of the world and the people in it, as well as a method for living in that complexity? If I were to really brave, I would say yes. <laughs> I would say it's a really, there's so many different tools and paradigms, and this is one for the toolbox. You know, whenever we find ourselves reacting out of a kind of sense that we have to do this or that, how can we introduce queer theory? It's it's one of the many tools that we should have in our toolbox. And I think that it's so useful because it's we've gone so long aggressively moving in the opposite direction. It's neither better nor worse than a lot of other ones, but because we exist under such systems that try to homogenize us, that try to do this stuff, that it's particularly useful. I think Toad summarized that in a really, really succinct way. I think there's so many, the, the process of attempting to define queer explodes in my mouth um, as I say it. So I'll, I'll, I'll just let that explode in the minds of the listeners. Yeah. Well, what I hear is something beautiful, something creative and imaginative mm-hmm. and great strength. Yes, I, I 100% agree. I want to cycle back quickly to the beginnings of your Instagram presence because I remember when you came out on Instagram and, you know, aesthetically it was really fresh. It, your postings had a different aesthetic feel and texture to what you'd seen from what other Permi people were putting out, which was much more about, you know, photos of gardens and uh, and things like that. The messaging and the, the sophistication and the, the kind of intellectual ideas that you were bringing into the postings was something very different from what other permaculture people uh, on Instagram were putting out. So there was something really fresh and exciting about it. So from my perspective, it's no surprise that it started to get traction very quickly. I just want to credit Guy there and their incredible design as well. (laughs) Um, Guy's an incredible artist. um, And I feel like a lot of our presence and a lot of our opportunities we've gotten are because of Guy's entrepreneurial kind of mindset, as well as their like, eye for beauty and design and detail. I think it was um, a a bit of a a labour of love and compromise because I had come from a very, um, you know, strange, fashion-y, artsy environment in Melbourne, um, which I would now describe as insufferable. Um, But coming into, you know, this, this permaculture space, it was there was a barrier to a lot of people accessing it simply because it was a whole aesthetic, a lifestyle, a philosophy that visually didn't translate to, to what a lot of, at least the queer communities I were in was, were experiencing. And so Todd and I had this back and forth of like, you know, we do want it to be authentic. We do want it to be um, a bit shabby chic, but we also want it to, to represent an, a, a new face, represent new ideas. And we wanted to uh, uplift those in the best way that we, we could. So we kind of had a back and forth between, you know, how are we representing these ideas? How are you representing these images? And yeah, no, it was it was really fantastic getting the, the response from various different communities. And I think because we took a diverse edge to what, what was currently, you know, the permaculture's aesthetic of sort of that, like, you know, dusty farmhouse, cottage core situation um, into a potentially more streamlined minimalist approach, which, I mean, you know, design aesthetics are neither here nor there. But I think when we talk about speaking to uh, cultures and communities that need to access the understanding of ecological function, um, if we understand ecological function, uh, we have to meet them on their own terms and sometimes their own terms is their own aesthetics. And so that's, that's really how that came about. And now we've kind of pushed a little bit beyond that of, you know, how do we represent these um, concepts and theories and um, approaches in a way that is both fun and colorful and refined but also has that sense of wonder, has that sense of, of, hey, this is a new, fresh idea. This might be done in a way that hasn't been done before. And I don't know, I kind of have to give a lot of credence to um, the element of campiness because it's so disarming to have 
something that's just so camp in your content because it's humble. It's kind of a bit daggy. It's kind of, and, and that's really been very disarming for us being, you know, a minority group that can get a lot of bullying, flack, discrimination and stigma um, when we're able to break those barriers with design conventions, whether or not they're systems design or literal graphic design, um, the effect is the same. And we get that message of aligning to ecological function through a lot better than have we done it any other way. It speaks to the, the concept of the edge. There's a real creativity that comes out of different marginalised communities. You see it in the arts all the time. Uh, but it's something that permaculture should really grab onto more because, like, the edge is such a core concept of permaculture thinking. Oh, absolutely. I have so many thoughts about the edge um, and how we become in right relationship with, with it as well. Like, you know, there's David's principle of use the edge and value the marginal, um, which I, I get. I, I think it comes from a good place, but it, it's spoken from someone sitting at the centre. It's, you know, it, it's speaking from you sit within the centre and you use the edge. Uh, and we value the marginal. Whereas if you're actually living on the edge and if you exist in the marginal, it's it's a very different experience as well. I would say that it's, it's in social spaces, there's so much uh, innovation and dynamism that exists in the edge, but there, there are definitely spaces of burnout as well um, and complexity and, and conflict and kind of, just because often there's a scarcity of resources. Uh, that is where things happen. You know, it's where many things kind of touch all at one point. And that can be such a space of beauty and transformation, or it can just be, it, it can be a complex space to be within. I remember going to a talk a while ago by um, someone in permaculture um, who was talking about how the future will be, you know, common families uh, kind of mixing up the traditional kind of living structure. And, you know, we're all going to live in communal living. That's the future. That's the future. And this, this man who's very privileged, kind of, you know, older older wealthy white man um was kind of getting a lot of accolades for it as well and i totally it was completely true i really believed it but it's also really frustrated because like a lot of the communities i'm a part of have pioneered this and done this work out of a sheer need for survival and so that's when i think we like we want to be mindful that we exist in right relationship with the edge we're not extracting from it or we're, we're tending to it we're giving if we exist in the center uh, we're introducing edge into our lives, yes, but we're also giving this the the wealth and the support that exists within the, se the center to the edge as well. It needs to be a reciprocal relationship, not an extractive one. Yeah, thanks for fleshing that out. Uh, this concept of the edge is of such fascination to me. The edge is exciting, and it, it's we talk a lot about queer theory uh, being the edge and the fringe, but you know, there's many different spaces. There's non-monogamy spaces, which are the edge. There are neurodiverse spaces, which are the edge. There are kink spaces, which are the edge. There's like quite fantastic liberation feminism that's the edge. And that's often where exciting things happen, where like the new ideas happen. And how do we support those spaces to innovate and be fantastic and, and lead the way and, not, and also not just endlessly extract from them? I think there's a real, real dance there that needs to happen. That can be really, I see sometimes people with the best intentions do so much harm to those existing at the edges. And um, yeah, just restructuring this idea of, of using it to relating with it. And, you know, edges is fantastic. But if we have so much edge, because, you know, um, if you have a, a really like a beach is an edge, for example, uh, it also is a space where a huge amount of litter comes up. If you don't have the resources to tend and support the edge, it can become a, a period where a place where so much things are happening that it can't support itself as well. Uh, so actually, you know, ecologically, you know, it's more prone to invasion of pests and weeds and things like that. So it needs more care. I often talk about just in organizing ourselves, we have a lot of edgy work where we do, where we go into spaces, we talk about loud things that are confronting and fun and exciting, but it, it can burn you out. And so we definitely have periods of rest where we actually have to retreat from the edge as best we can, because we're always living on the edge a little bit, um, to kind of a home center to rest and take a break from that. Because otherwise we just become burnt out and bitter and, you know, we want to be good pioneer species, not, not the poisonous variety. Guy, do, is there anything else you want to say about the edge? I don't know if I'll be repeating some stuff that um, Toad has said, but I suppose... 
I'll speak more to um, our intentions with, with the edge. So, you know, one of the principles is use the edge and value the margin. I think Toe might may have said this, but the concept of the edge being something to use um, is, is something that I think we really need to think about because it's not a resource to be mined. It's, it's, uh, the the growing space of generation that is fragile and vulnerable and we need to support that and so when we say use the edge as a principle we need to think about what kind of energy we come to that with because um minority groups diverse groups innovation groups are not something to be mined for whatever you know purposes that we have and i think for us at permaqueer we've really thought a lot about what what does it mean to queer? What what is this edge? And the sort of analogy I use is, you know, when you get those sort of filaments on the surface of your eye and you look at them and every time you look at them, they go away. That That's our approach to this. You know, if you watch how things that are on the edge get absorbed by society, they become the center. So we have to be critical of, of when are things absorbed into this space? When do they become a social norm? And what is generative from there? Not so much in this like stressed innovation, constantly go, 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 but how do we view our ethics and and how do we change this behavior and what might be behind the reasons why we struggle to change? And I think for me, I feel like I've lived at the edge majority of my, my life but I've also had the privilege of being able to communicate back into the center and be valued back into the center. Not, not necessarily all the time, um, but enough to, to bring back some of the jewels that I find at the edge and recognize that that space is so important to be nurtured, to be cared for, because that's where the true innovation of the world comes from. And if we're not holding that place sacred, how do we expect to grow? And I think that's one of the biggest lessons that we as a society need to acknowledge and we need to step back, we need to sit down, we need to rest, we need to have a think and come at it from a more supportive approach. Yeah. The Edge Dwellers Cafe. Probably a good segue into speaking about trauma-based practice. I know this is something that you raised when we spoke earlier about what we talk about in this podcast. A lot of people find permaculture from a place of wounding and come to it as a place to heal. That was certainly one of the reasons that brought me to permaculture. So how do you incorporate trauma-based practice into the work that you're doing? I think you raised a really good point about how permaculture is often a space where people who are wounded by life and, and feel disenfranchised, feel disillusioned, often come to, and they come to for healing. Um, and then often sometimes they'll think it's great, and then they'll start to, as wounded or traumatized as they are, then they'll start to teach permaculture. Uh, that's that's a pattern that I've seen, and I, I, I understand it. I think it's really difficult to address trauma from a place of scarcity. I would say that for us, there's a real focus on connection and abundance mindset. Uh, we do, I use the the window of tolerance as a model quite a lot to actually, I introduced it, I think uh, about midway through our PDC and in social permaculture, we talk about this idea called the window of tolerance. And it's this idea of there's limits in which your nervous system can kind of exist happily. And when you step outside of that, you go into the, the standard fight, flight, freeze, fawn, flop. But basically, like when you're under certain cultural stresses or, or life stresses, your nervous system kicks off in a way that will try to put you back into the sense of safety. And whether that uses any of the tools you have available, whether that's tools of sexism, tools of homophobia, tools of extraction, of empire, you're more likely to use those tools to get back and, and use the familiar tools of, of the world that's kind of fucked us up to get back to the healthy, safe nervous system place. And so we talk a lot about, you know, in just with our class, we talk about, all right, um, you know, you might find this confronting if you need to stim, you know, like stimulate, if you need to take a moment, if you need to do this, there's like just in the classroom, there's so many things you can do to allow people the space 
to feel safe, to regulate, to calm down, to connect, to debrief. And it also has a moving forward a little bit when we do this kind of work of, of queering permaculture. And I just want to give a definition of queering that was given to us by Hannah Breckbill. And I might be paraphrasing it a little bit, but it's interrogating social norms and redesigning systems to better meet your needs and the needs of all. Um, so that's a really useful language for, for queering that I use. When we try to queer things, it, it confronts people because it, it might make them uh, face some privileges or some things in themselves that they don't want to hear about. Uh, shame and blame are not really good tools. The analogy I use is in a lot of um, decolonization kind of spaces, you know, there's a focus on um, land back, which is, a, you know, central and important and something that we need to do. And there's this very much this kind of the language that's used sometimes is like colonial culture is wicked and evil and, uh, you know, particularly white people who exist and are benefited by it. They need to stop that. And it's true. We do need to stop it. But white supremacy kind of silos off like to, to participate in white supremacy you often lose a lot of your actual cultural. Like I don't know any of my Irish cultural practices. I don't know my stories, my song, my native language, my, you know, the, the, the tools that I would have to orientate my ethics into the land and into the community, those are gone. Uh, those were don gone during colonization. So I'm, uh, I use permaculture to kind of step up, to try to step outside of colonization, but often what people are left with, it's this kind of narrative of like, don't do the colonial thing, but they have nothing to kind of then use to support themselves. So that if I really reduce it down, it's like, you know, if you've only ever stolen to feed yourself and you, that's the only thing you know how to do, someone telling you to be a good person, you need to not steal. So your choice is then steal or starve. I find that that really confronts people and triggers people. Uh, the work that I do uh, as someone who's white is I, I, tr I basically talk about how dismantling white supremacy benefits white people. Uh, because we know as as unfair and unjust as it is, when it comes from me, a white person, other white people listen to me. It's not confronting. They don't read it as a personal attack. They don't get as defensive. Uh, that's my role as a pioneer species, so that other people can come in and be able to talk about work without everyone freaking out, if that makes any sense. So it, it's kind of, you know, addressing this fact of a lot of people want to do this good work, but a lot of them don't have the tools to exist outside of those systems of violence. So it's like, hey, this system actually does you harm. How can you build up skills of community? What are the ways that you've been kneecapped in uh, kind of in, in the skills of community? And how can we help you build that sense of safety and abundance and security? So when we challenge and we try to dismantle systems of violence, you are not left adrift. I think as well, you know, from my perspective, our approach to being trauma informed, you kind of have to be aware of the spectrum of trauma because we have our sort of macro societal traumas of, you know, patriarchy, capitalism, colonialism, all these massive things. And then we actually have the very acute expressions that are our day to day, life to life relationship traumas. And, you know, it's kind of like a river. We have to go through these day to day ones. We have to resolve them. We have to process them. We have to be aware of them. We have to surface them. We have to be conscious of them in order to see the patterns between all of them. And so in our teaching, it's very much how do we soften every single environment so that we're dealing with these day-to-day -day traumas um, and we're aware of them and we're co-regulating them as a group. So in a lot of our group settings, we'll start off with a check-in. We'll start off with an explicit social contract of a brave space, not necessarily a safe space because harm will happen. We don't all come from the same cultural backgrounds. We may step on each other's toes. And we need to make sure that we're not saying that we're not going to step on each other's toes, but we're saying that if we do that, we will hold ourselves accountable and actually we will all hold each other accountable. And I think this is, this is where it becomes cultural. And this is why we're really, really interested in what our cultural response is to climate change, because there's so many conventions from my Maori culture, such as the Hongi, which is how, when you meet each other, it's, you share a breath by pressing your foreheads together and breathing in. And there's so many conventions that exist in indigenous cultures that don't exist in colonial culture. And, you know, we have our hug. That's wonderful. I think in COVID times, it's very difficult. And we have to start thinking about 
what are these little in-between conventions that manage our nervous systems collectively so that we can start thinking about what are these larger systems that are actually causing our, our nervous systems to approach. So I think explicitly we, we have two approaches. The first one is dealing with the issue here and now by speaking to everyone, allowing everyone the space to communicate how they're feeling, checking in, talking about how people respond to certain top up topics and allowing space to have for people to resolve the actual emotional response that they have rather than this very capitalist colonial like you have to accept absolutely everything and be a professional the whole way through it and you have to be able to do everything and frankly that's that's just that's the trauma that's what it is right there it's not giving any um, any nervous system the second to figure out where the hell it's at and and when we think about macro systems when we think about colonization currently the violent end of of colonization is playing out on indigenous people it's playing out on people of color it's playing out on black people it's playing out on women but if you think about the history of this what we deem as a white culture is the wreckings of of this trauma from long ago and i think when we acknowledge that we have a system that's predicated on people who are so deeply traumatized they don't even remember why they're traumatized all of a sudden we start to have a critical approach to oh some of these cultural conventions may not be appropriate and once we get to that space you know we're able to to design change and we're able to accept it but it's impossible to get to that place if our nervous system is being attacked the whole way through. So it's very much the micro trauma patterns that we have to, to speak to and act to and resonate to because that's the pathway to have those larger conversations. So tra- trauma-informed approaches is, is so critical, not just to permaculture. This is everything in the world right now needs to be critically aware that we need to move at the slowest pace of the most triggered nervous system in the room otherwise we're not going to resolve it so many wonderful points there the idea of the brave space rather than the safe space is so important because if you've got a strictly safe space then you can't go anywhere Mm. to to process the really difficult stuff whereas the brave space it gives you room to be able to do that in caring way your point about how decolonizing practice benefit white people, part of that is remembering the historical baggage. It's, it's, a, it's a messy field as well. Like my ancestors are Irish English, um, you know, and like there's a fantastic book. I can't remember the name of the author, but it's um, how the Irish became white and how like there are a number of other kind of groups that like whiteness itself is, is a really weird construct. Like, uh, you know, there is, and there's, we constantly see new groups being promoted into whiteness as well. Uh, it's only recently that the Irish were considered white, that Italians were considered white. Uh, and we have so many different lang- words to even describe whiteness. You know, there's, there, there is the language white, there is Anglo-Saxon, which res- refers to a really vague period of, you know, invasion into the British Isles, British Isles. There's Caucasian, and I, I've never seen the Caucasus and I have no relation to the actual Caucasus Islands, like uh, Caucasus Mountains, not islands. And even within whiteness, there's a hierarchy of what is a better white. Because, yeah, it, it's a tool. Like, And this is, I think, what in permaqueer we really like to look at is um, we know what the things are. We know white supremacy. We know patriarchy. We know, you know, all these things of cis, cis-hetero patriarchy, for example. But what are the patterns behind them that, that collapse us and homogenize us? That, you know, just like agriculturally, we make monocultures because they're easier to extract from. So to do socially, we silo diverse groups of people into these homogenous categories and extract from them, or we use them to further perpetuate trauma on others, you know, hurt people, hurt people. So like, you know, there's patterns of uh, homogenization in our communities. To be a good uh, kind of person under white supremacy, you need to have a lot of learned helplessness. You need to be dependent upon that system. So you have to have very few skills in community I did some work with uh, Madeline Taylor, who's incidentally Guy's mother, <laughs> and Debbie Long, who's this fantastical medical anthropologist. And we kind of talked quite a lot about how the ways that white supremacy kneecaps white people. And there's a lot of comparisons between overindulgence models in children and uh, being privileged under systems of violence. And some of the things that overindulged children are is they get their needs met without asking. They um, 
there are rules that are soft rules. So you can break the rules and get away with it because you're white. And there's a few things there that, you know, we know how that leads in children. It leads to poor kind of um, senses of entitlement. It leads to an inability to give or receive feedback. So fragility. So there's a lot of interesting patterns there. And then of course, when you exist like that, it's very hard. You exist in such a state of fragility and entitlement and learned helplessness that you never want to dismantle that system. Yeah, I suppose I'll just add to the intersection of like where this plays a particularly damaging role in scarcity as a reality and scarcity as a mindset. Because when we grow up in these cultures of scarcity mindset, we have this inherent fear that we have a lack of something. And this is what I see in Australia everywhere, that there's a scarcity mindset that's not matched up with scarcity in reality. In fact, we are one of the wealthiest nations in the global North. And it is insane how many resources we absolutely hemorrhage. Yet every single day, the cultural expression is we don't have enough. We're scarcity. We do not want to share. We need our security and our privacy. We need to make sure that no one's going to steal from us because there's not enough to go around. In comparison to a lot of the global South countries where they have next to nothing and they all know that they can share with each other. They all have community accountability and sufficiency and the degree of scarcity as a mindset doesn't necessarily exist. There's varying ways where this plays out in terms of resources. It could be food, it could be housing, it could be land. But one thing that we experience quite a lot is that a lot of people with the most stuff here in Australia are so terrified of not having enough, but somehow cannot reconcile that they actually aren't in scarcity. And this becomes particularly damaging and frustrating for people of colour or minorities that are literally in scarcity and their response is actually valid to what's happening. So this is when this macro trauma comes in because all of a sudden we're having these white, affluent, well-resourced people. It's actually a trauma response. They think they don't have enough because they've been reaffirmed through their whole childhood, through this overindulgence, through this white privilege that they're able to get all these things but there's all these soft and weird boundaries and actually at some point something's going to be taken away from them so there's this core trauma of like okay I know the rules but I also don't I should be allowed to have everything but I also shouldn't and I do have a lot but I can't reconcile it and that's very damaging to people of color who are literally in situations where they're like, I don't have a lot and I'm just trying to deal with what I have and make do and don't necessarily have the the trauma responses per se. They're trying to respond appropriately, but to the fact that they cannot get these resources, to the fact that the people that hold these resources are wield this privilege in very violent, very distressing ways that causes a complete different type of trauma. So there's a really interesting intersection here of co-liberation between these two groups. And, you know, we're very, very focused on designs that are mutually beneficial because anything else is a just white saviorism and you're just coming in for some kind of ego trip or some boost. But if you're not coming in, in the words of Lila Watson, if your liberation is bound to my liberation, then let us work together. And if it's not, then leave. Or something like that. I'm probably hor- hor- horrifically misquoting, but it's very true. One thing that privileged people need to recognize, and this is very pertinent in the work that Toad's doing around how white supremacy kneecaps white people, is what is the trade-off and where is that liberation? And there's a lot of work to be done in this space But once we start recognizing that, that's when we see the trauma healing. That's when we see white Australia recognizing that it's completely emotionally stunted, has no idea how, you know, these ecosystems work. And there's a wealth of 65,000 plus years of the most beautiful, deep culture that you can be a part of if only you stopped traumatizing these people. And, you know, that's really what, the future we see, we, we see if we have enough of a trauma informed approach, we'll start having systems and conventions and organizations designed around our nervous systems. And we'll start working through the years and years of trauma that this colony has. And dare I say, I hope on the other side of that, we can come together as a one meaningful culture and 
you know, there's a lot of work to be done there, but I think it's important for us to, to continue to walk towards that despite what else is happening in the world. And I think that's part of our mission at Permaqueer. Much of permaculture thinking is based on the prophecy of a future of energy descent and even collapse. That seems to really feed into this common scarcity mindset. Have you got any thoughts on that? Oh, almost certainly, yes. I think when you're trying to design from a system of, of scarcity, and this is why, you know, you saw a lot of those older generation permaculture folk, you know, the wealthy white landowners, but the lifestyle block, the wife and 2.5 kids, and they're going to like, it, it very reminiscent of like kind of prepper culture a little bit, like, you know, hoarding guns, hoarding seeds. Uh, I, I much prefer someone have seeds than guns, mind you, but it, it's still this very rugged individualism. And it's honestly and truly, if you are trying to survive on your own, your little block, uh, and, and the world is collapsing, I'd much rather put my energy into kind of before things collapse, create designs that look after community. I often say that self-sufficiency is a myth because, um, you know, or the, the myth of sustainability under self-sufficiency. Because like, you know, if you if you hit 85 and your knees blow out and this beautiful permaculture system you've been working on and perfecting for the last 40 years falls apart because you can't look after it, it was inherently never sustainable. It was never something there. Like it's community sufficiency is where it's at. So if you have diverse groups of people um, who community only works really well from a space of abundance as well. If you have a bunch of people working, and this comes back to the window of tolerance model. Um, if you have a bunch of people existing under scarcity um, who are trying to build community because they're they're alarmed, their nervous systems are kind of distressed, they're, they're sensing fear, they will start to use those tools of empire to secure themselves. Self-centeredness, I was uh, in this great book, I, I have to find the title and send it to you somewhere, but they're talking about self-centeredness is, is a survival and a trauma response. Because you think that if you aren't centering your own needs, you won't be able to survive in that place. Uh, and then invariably we start to see those same models and patterns of extraction and harm. You start seeing the misogyny, you start seeing the queer phobia, because it's that, that entropic breakdown of things where like, you collapse things into simple categories and simple us versus them. You know, we're the good guys, they're the bad guys, so we can take what we want from them. But those systems collapse. So I think when you design from a place of scarcity at the very beginning, you are building in your own kind of inevitable collapse. Or maybe that's just me being a hippy dippy wishy-washy person. But um, I really think you need to actually be working out, like Guy said, that, that model of co-liberation, of co-benefit, of, of, you know, within your, within your bioregion, uh, within your nation, within your country, within, you know, inter internationally as well, kind of constantly designing from that space of, of, of abundance and that through connection and complexity, we have much more resilience than simplicity and binaries. In a deep descent has been something that I've been kind of terrifyingly witness actually a lot more this year. And one thing that I will say is this whole concept I, I don't think it's going to play out in the way that we believe it is. The, the way I say that is there's, there's many assumptions on the way that we live our lives based off of the systems that we have that we just, we just accept as a given. For example, town water supply. If that were to be taken away from us, it would just be preposterous. It would be ridiculous. It's like how... We need water. Like we just, you know, and it, and it would just be like, this is ridiculous. How could anyone allow the ecosystem to just stop providing us, you know, all of these, these things. And my biggest fear is that there are undefined areas within our ecosystem, which we've witnessed in the past as the, the, the household economy, the, the work that women do, you know, historically that actually props up a lot of the work um, that, that the workforce actually does. A, a, a lot of systems that will not be allowed, will, will not function a, a, as, these, as these greater systems collapse. So, for example, one thing that I'm witnessing across um, the, the arts because of how much of a toll it took because of COVID and, you know, the stress of climate change and the stress of watching the... Australian political shit show explode in front of us is that a lot of the simple processes 
that supported the payment of artists, that supported the execution of shows, that su- supported something from going A to B, just as simple as that, something so silly. But that A to B happened on a regular basis by many, many people who had the capacity to do it. And my fear is that this energy descent will take out those areas first, those areas that we didn't know, those areas that we took for granted, those areas that we just did on top of what we did without being asked to. And and I'm witnessing a lot of people being damaged by that. And I have no idea why that's happening. Um, There's a lot of different systemic stresses coming out in, in a lot of different ways. But I do know that when we come back into a grassroots approach, we take an order of what we do have, we manage our resources with our community, and instead of saying what do we want, we think what do we have and what do we need and how to ensure that, that's when we build resilience. And, and when we think about the ecological function of that, that's when we get regeneration. And so, frankly, every single system, every economic system, every industry, every creative, absolutely every business in the world has to front up with what is their regenerative policy because at some point or other this energy descent will come upon them and either they will stay tethered to the previous systems that were propped up by damaging environmental you know systems of extraction or they'll be able to design a way through ecological function to do what they did or pivot from what they did into a way that's regenerative but frankly i don't see any future within these archaic extractive ways of being and the real fear for me is not us the fear for me is is those people whose leadership and those people who don't have the resources or don't have the people advocating for them to make this shift and those are the real losers and you know for example Rosemary Morrow says that in the, the studies show that by 2050 we're going to have 2.5 billion displaced people because of the climate effects. That is an insane amount of people. That is it, it is terrifying. And the fact that we can't dawn on some of these cascading effects and we can't have a holistic approach is indicative of how our culture makes us think. And so I suppose this is again a roundabout way to come back to the fact that. People who do think about these holistic systems and people who do understand this ecological function are our First Nations and Indigenous cultures. And while we may not understand all of the conventions, it's critical that we start adhering to their leadership. Otherwise, you know, this descent will be horrendous. The choice of TEDx as a platform. Uh, and what and leading to the 2021 lush spring prize for social and environmental regeneration so that was great recognition of what you'd done on tedx so i'm just interested in in how you arrived at using tedx what the process was like and then all of the the amazing range of people that you got to participate in this and thinking particularly of the second tedx event that you held which drew in a, a really diverse group of people from beyond the permaculture orbit I was on this one. T- TEDx was, uh, so TEDx launched this countdown event, which was like, okay, we're going to focus on distributing our platform to communities to have their own events. And I think they intended it to be like small community halls where people got together and they offered their platform for sort of micro expressions. And we were like, nah, we're not, you know, they said it was contained to one day and that's all you could do. And I replied saying, no, I want to do a three-day event. You know, we've got a whole bunch of people interested. We can't fit them all in one day. And I was very, I don't know, for me, I had a queer approach of kind of breaking TEDx's boundaries because they sent me all the requirements that they had. And I said, hey, actually, your requirements of a community don't fit for my community. This this global binary, you know, regulation isn't going to work for us. And so I really pleaded the case. And fortunately, you know, they addressed things with complexity and they read my application and said, you know, yeah, okay, cool. And we recognise that TEDx is, supports a very sort of tech philosophy approach to things Um, but they also have a very massive platform that has a lot of rapport behind it and 
we we are strong on our ethics. We are strong on where we come and we understand where that is. And I don't think we soften that at all to fit to the TEDx mold. And we spoke explicitly to that. And, you know, we have a very transformative approach to everything that we do, which means that we will try and work with everybody so long as we are treated with respect and we're able to have a conversation about feedback. There are some really horrible organizations out there that people like, you know, I wouldn't work with them. I wouldn't do this, i.e. like, you know, big mining companies and that. But frankly, these companies that are doing so much harm need to be having these kinds of conversations in their boardrooms and with their collaborators. Otherwise, no one's going to have that conversation and change isn't going to happen. So we we came across and we, and we got the license and then um, just did a call out and got really audacious with it. We're like, let's, let's just, you know, at that point we were t- tiny. I think we had maybe like 150 followers on Instagram and, you know, nothing at all had happened. And then all of a sudden, person after person, we got, yes, I'll do this. Yes, I'll do this. You know, we love this vision. We love that. And we cultivated this really beautiful first event, community responses to climate change, which blew up. And I think we had three weeks to pull it together and we had over 7,000 people watch the event all of the big heavyweights in permaculture in Australia came along. They lent their whole audience, you know, if so many wonderful things are inspired from that. And it was really, really fantastic. And so TEDx aside, the things that they've done, the impact that this platform gave us was tremendous. And I've seen a lot of the speakers that met each other because of our connection that are now doing these amazing initiatives that we weren't, we didn't do them, but we created that mycelial connection between them for them to do it. And and it's beautiful, you know, and then moving on to this year, we wanted to know what was, what was a bit deeper than communities, what, what drove communities and that was culture. And we paired with an amazing cultural capacity um, indigenous group uh, called Mahana Culture, who are incredible and, and they're really, really doing some cutting edge regenerative work in terms of how we understand culture and how we understand ourselves. And that sort of laid down the foundation of how do we understand the culture we're in? How do we understand the difference between other cultures around us? And how do we work with that and instead of fighting it? We started to cultivate what are the perspectives that we need to have in this room? And we had, we we reached out to Indigenous leaders all across the world. We had Pacifica Indigenous leaders from Oregon who were settling on that country, creating food boxes appropriate for different cultures by seeing how they could cultivate their culturally, you know, historical diet in a new landscape. And, you know, that's revolutionary. How do you celebrate your own culture, but how do you align that with being a settler on another country? And so we're having these weird nuanced conversations about how do we come into right relationship with our culture? What is the right culture? You know, what is ethical culture and what isn't? And, you know, it really started a really, really significant conversation that a lot more work is going to go into from us here at Permaqueer. But that platform got together a really, really amazing group of people who all shared what Indigenous solutions were And I think it was around the time of COP26, which was just such a huge disappointment that it felt like this kind of hidden gem that we had all to ourselves where we had a really revolutionary discussion about what the cultural responses were and what they needed to be. And throughout this, TEDx has been a really massive support for us being a platform. We don't necessarily take direction from them acutely or passively, And we're not here to sell any of the ideas or any of their products. We explicitly came in with this is a platform that we can get this important message of Indigenous sovereignty through. So we're going to use it. And if at some point it becomes problematic or we stop being treated with respect or we see some systemic issues, we will talk about, we will outline what better approaches will be. And if they're not comfortable taking that on, then, then we can no longer collaborate with them. But we haven't explicitly come across that yet. Yeah. I I think at this point, we really all need to be leaning into what does it look like to work together, even with some environments or ecosystems that may have had a checkered past and how can we transform that? Because 
the world needs transformation in every way, in every place. Queering, it shouldn't be scary. And it should be something that actually can be really beneficial to anyone. Being able to kind of question what are the social norms that I just assume are good? Are they actually perpetuating trauma into myself and my communities? Are they, you know, perpetuating ecological ruin? Uh, And how can I redesign them? It can be as simple as that. And, you know, queer people, whether uh, and sometimes people, you know, refer to queer people as LGBT people, LGBT plus people, but some people use queer to describe the fringe dwellers, the the edge dwellers, the, you know, the people I think I've said who are non-monogamous, who are um, quite radically feminist, who are uh, sometimes even in, in white spaces, people consider that First Nations people, the, the people who live kink lifestyles or all kinds of different things in non-traditional ways. How can we actually be in right relationship with the edge dwellers and learn from them and and engage in a kind of cultural exchange instead of just theft at the edge? I think we can all benefit from looking at at ourselves. What are the kind of systems that we just unintentionally replicate? And how can we redesign them to better meet our own needs, better create abundance in our own lives and a more equitable and fair and abundant system for our community? Um, I think in conclusion, I, I just have like a call to action for potential listeners to see how how can we use queering as a verb and 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 how can we put that out as an intention and being intentional you know you're on um Wurundjeri land woman jika come with purpose it's very important for us to understand explicitly what our intention and we have recognized that when we explicitly come with that queer intention um a lot of generative stuff happens and if we if we don't come with that intention, we come with our passive intentions, which are our biases, they are our cultural conditionings, they are our traumas, if we're not aware, that we're bringing into these spaces. And so that's a really, really tangible thing that we can do. Um, and then sort of as a plug for Permaqueer as well, like we said earlier, it's a, a network of resources And we put a lot of time and energy into how do we ecologically design the management of these resources. Now, it's really wonderful to go through all the theory and have all of our case studies and and operate these. But we're moving into a place where we want to actually start managing resources. And so my call out here is, you know, if you are a listener in the future or whatever, this system would really benefit from more resources being contributed to it in whichever way that looks like. And I know in Australia, we were talking earlier about hyper-privileged people with a lot not being able to recognise that. One of the most beautiful things we can do is contribute to community. And so this call out is not for like personal gain for us or for Permaqueer. It's we need more resources in this, supporting our community, giving back and just not designed in the way that capitalism and colonialism has forced things to be designed. And with others' contribution, we'll be able to create this new tomorrow. We'll be able to have larger rubrics for why this design is the approach that we should have. And we hope to build larger and larger case studies so that we can start making recommendations to councils or governments or whatever. And that's one of our theories of change. I might tack on something to that as well. And, you know, like we're, we're, I think we're quite cool, but I'm sure there's someone in your local community or your local area who's doing queer work. How can you support them, whether it's time and labor and volunteering, or if you have a, a lot of financial or resources, how can you resource the people in your bioregion who are actually doing this work? Toad and Guy, this has been a wonderful yarn. Thank you so much for joining us at the Edge Dwellers Cafe. It's Thank been a pleasure. Thank you so much, Ben. Thank you so much for having us. The Edge Dwellers Cafe. What a great conversation. It was such a pleasure speaking with Guy and Toad. The whole concept of being in right relationship with the richness of people and cultures at the margin, in right relationship with the Edge Dwellers, this is what community building is really all about. One of my issues with the mainstream permaculture vision for small communities and village level social organisation is that in practice, this tends to produce monocultures of people who are all the same. 
It's also my observation that the mainstream of the permaculture movement in Australia is very vanilla. I think we can do better than this. The methodology for community building that Toad and Guy are offering, based on queering, decolonization and trauma-informed practice, I think this gives us an antidote to that tendency towards monoculture. It gives us a map and a vehicle for tangibly operationalizing the people care and fair share ethics. We all talk a good game about ethical practice, but walking the walk is always harder. Life is messy and life is chaotic, and we all come together in community with trauma and baggage. The permaqueer methodology is so refreshing because it invites us to build community from where we are, not where we myopically imagine ourselves to be. A reminder that you can support the Edge Dwellers Cafe podcast by clicking the like and subscribe buttons on whatever platform you're listening on. And send through a dollar or two on Ko-Fi to help me cover the costs of releasing the Edge Dwellers Cafe into the world. And if you like what you hear, please do share the links around with people in your orbit. Your support is very much appreciated. Okay, that's a wrap from the EDC. I'm Ben Habib, and you've been listening to the Edge Dwellers Cafe podcast. Stay safe and much love.